We've missed you. Pour yourself a drink, pop some popcorn, throw those wings in the oven, grab any snack. It is time to catch up over pre-show cocktails, or tea, or water, or whatever. Before the curtain rises at our favorite place, the Stratford Festival. Let's gab about the shows of the 2021 season, the plays, and the cabarets. This, this is show Showstarters. Starters. With Alexis. And Ijoma. Cheers! Cheers. Hello and welcome to Show Starters. My name is Ijoma Imaswam. I am here with my guests uh, and we come to you from Stratford, Ontario, Canada, the ancestral land of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat and the Neutrals. It is governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and Treaty 29. And we are so honored to live in this land and, and honor this, this beautiful, beautiful city. I am lucky to be here with three incredible guests today. The director, designer, and one of the actors of Edward Elby's Three Tall Women. We have acclaimed actor and director, Diana LeBlanc. Diana has worked extensively across Canada as an actor and director. She is recipient of the Governor General's Performing Arts Award for Lifetime Artistic Achievement of her illustrious career spanning over half a century. When asked what has given her the most pride, she named directing Sweet Bird of Youth, which she said was a blessing in its challenges and its demands, and mentioned her work bridging the gap between English and French audiences with Théâtre Français de Toronto, for which she held the position of artistic director from 1991 to 1996. She was one of the first graduates from the National Theatre School of Canada. Martha was in the same year, uh, but on the English side of the program. She is a founding member of Soul Pepper Theatre Company. The pandemic halted her preparation of Three Tall Women three days before the rehearsal. This production marks Diana's 14th season with the festival. Hello, Diana. Hello. We also have joining us today designer Francesca Callo. Continually inspired by the potential and frisson of theater and all the possibilities that exist therein, Francesca's work as a designer has taken her across Canada, the US and the UK, crossing between film and television and theater design with ease and acclaim. Her passion has also led her to work for English Heritage, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings and Condé Nast at the World of Interiors magazine. She has inspired many, many people with her skill and vision as a designer at the festival for over a decade. When COVID hit, she was in the midst of one of her most intense seasons, she says, designing for the 2020 productions of Richard III and Three Tall Women. 2021 marks her 13th season designing for the Stratford Festival. Hello, Francesca. Hi. And lastly, but certainly not least, the inspiring Martha Henry. Her extraordinary career has made her, which she says, incredibly lucky and has seen her honored as a companion to the Order of Canada and a member of the Order of Ontario. She has been awarded the Stratford Legacy Award, the Governor General's Lifetime Achievement Award and seven honorary doctorates. I, Joma, was fortunate enough to be mentored and guided by her under her role as director of the Birmingham Conservatory, which she held for 10 years. She served as the artistic director of the Grand Theatre from 1988 to 1994. She too was in rehearsals for Richard III and about to begin rehearsals for Three Tall Women when the pandemic struck. This production will mark Miss Henry's 45th season with the Stratford Festival. Hello, Martha. Hi, Joma. Hi. Now, if the world were different and COVID didn't bar us from meeting in person, bar, <laughs> we would like to imagine that you would find us tucked into a dimly lit booth at Foster's here in Stratford with a good bottle of white wine with a few ice cubes in it for Martha. Uh, Diana may have a, a, bar, a glass of red or a martini, she says. And I think Francesca has cajoled me into drinking something green and fruity. But in lieu of that, I'm drinking something red and fruity. I invite you all who are viewing to get, grab a libation and join us for pre-show drinks as we discuss Edward Elby's existentially human play, Three Tall Women. It is a play with 
three women playing the possible every woman. They, na they are named only as A, B, and C. A, on her deathbed in the throes of joyous clarity and reverberating dementia, reflects with the other women the joys, shames, loves, regrets, adventures, and hopes of her life. It is an interesting ode to Elby's self-proclaimed exorcism and rings with what I feel um, a call for reconciliation and desire to free the soul of personal restraints. Thank you, Martha, Francesca, and Diana. It's so wonderful to see you. You look incredible. <laughs> Thank you, Ijoma. Thanks to Jim. I think you're drinking fruit punch, Ijoma. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sparkling with uh, some cranberry in it. It tastes nice. very, it's actually very refreshing. Um, Martha, before our talk, um, we, we chatted a little bit, and you proclaim that the pandemic has caught you in the limbo of Edward Elby's world. Can you um, start us off with this conversation talking about Elby and the origins of Three Tall Women? Well, Three Tall Women is uh, about Elby's mother. Mm -hmm. Her name was Frankie Francis Cotter Elby. Um, she was, to all intents and purposes, a formidable character. She was almost six feet tall. She wasn't actually six feet tall, but everyone who meets her uh, or who met her described her as being a uh, hugely tall woman over six feet. She wasn't. She was five foot ten, um, but she used to wear heels to make herself taller. And she was, uh, she was a force. The Stratford Company was in New York, and we were doing Much Ado About Nothing and The Miser. One morning in my hotel room, the phone rang, and a voice said, Hello, this is Edward Alby. And I said, of course, something like, Oh, don't be silly, who is this? But it actually was Edward Albee, and he said that he was coming to the play that night. I believe we were doing Much Ado, and he said, could we have a drink afterwards? And I, <laughs> I was going to say I thought it over. I didn't think it over. I just said, why, well, yes, of course, that would be wonderful. And so after the show, he came backstage and he and Richard Manette, who had directed both the shows, and Bill Hutt and I all went back to the hotel where we were staying, and we had a drink in the bar. I stood up to go after a while, and he leaned across the table and whispered in my ear, look me up next time you come to New York. And I didn't know what to say, and what I said stupidly was, whispering in his ear, I don't have your number. <laughs> and then there was nothing else for me to say but leave and go to my room. And so then I never did look him up when I was in New York, and I never did get his number. But I saw him a few times when he came to Toronto. I'd love to shift over and, and uh, speak with Francesca and Diana. Um, this production, including the full cast, I believe, was about to begin, begin rehearsals in 2020. And I'm sure, like Martha, you have all been marinating on this specific play for a, a long time, probably back to 2019, I can imagine. Um, can you, Francesca and Diana, talk to us about the incredible evolution this play has been through um, with the design, um, the concept, what you've been inspired by? It's a play about age loss, all of that. And um, so it's very much um, what I've been sitting in as a, an aging woman person for the last few years. I mean, not in a morbid way, don't get me wrong. He's too insightful and um, inspiring, really. Francesca and I started working on this, first to be uh, produced at the studio theater. And we worked very hard and happily, I have to say. It was my first time working with Francesca, and I just loved it. And then came March 17th. There was a hiatus because nobody knew what was happening for the longest time. Mm -hmm. Then things fired up again, I guess, last November, was it? And 
and then it was to be under a canopy. I thought the design was gorgeous, a canopy outside, open sides. There were many challenges to being outside, which Francesca dealt with, I thought, really brilliantly. And then we were told, no, that was not going to happen because the, the, uh, it was being built at the festival and the shop was being closed. So then we were in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I, I think I kind of stopped there and thought, we'll see what Francesca says. I heard from Francesca saying, okay, what do we do now? I've got some ideas. Meanwhile, oh God, those poor people at La Haute Direction, you know, Anthony and Anita and David. Anthony called and said, N now we're thinking of delaying the opening and going inside to the studio. Full so, circle. <laughs> by the time we got back to the studio, we had traversed any number of venues and in our imaginations, more and more accumulated. And so at the moment, it has the studio, but many elements of what we discovered doing it for the uh, uh, the canopy. Am I right, Francesca? Yeah. Okay. I think, yeah, I think what we liked about the, uh, the canopy idea is that originally the canopy was like an opaque kind of sail tent canvas. And so it gave you this kind of light box effect. And, um, and it was a semicircle, like a kind of banana shape. So it was really wide and really shallow. And yet it was really kind of an interesting space. So we sort of adapted the, um, the design to kind of spread out towards each end. So yeah, we never really got back to what we had originally designed for the studio, which, which you will see, I guess, at, at one point. But we kind of, you know, it's sort of like we move forward and then it was really hard to move backwards to what we had before. So we kind of kept going forwards. And so the design actually... I think it changed quite dramatically. Mm -hmm. It sort of became more realistic and less realistic at the same time. Mm. But I think what was interesting, I think for, for us and really for me was the idea of bringing the outdoors when we were in the outdoor venue, like we weren't allowed to have sort of these theatrical conventions, you know, we weren't having blackout, you know, uh, lights. Light. Um, so it was more like doing almost like a film set, but in a kind of abstract way, which was kind of amazing because you don't normally get to do that. So we kind of took the best of that and then brought it back into the studio and it had a different kind of feeling to it. Can you talk about any of the, um, the adjustments or the inspirations that have come out of this, um, this pause, this great pause? Like what, what has this gift kind of of COVID lent to the design? For me, I think we were so, um, we everybody wanted to get outside and, and seeing nature and the way that nature is oblivious to kind of everything that was going on globally was just so um, uplifting, I think, for a lot of people. And so in a way, I wanted to bring that upliftingness, uh, that effect to the set. The other thing, the... Um sort of a major change was the fact that once we moved outside and nothing could be longer than an hour and a half, mm -hmm. we briefly, briefly, Martha and I both had a look at this, what could be cut. Well, you can't cut, Edward Albee, because if you pull one thread here, all sorts of other things in the tapestry fall apart. So that was a no-go. What if we do it in two parts, present the first half and the second half separately. Mm -hmm. So that became uh, what we were intending. What I like about what we ended up with, the more I think about it, is this notion uh, that the set in Act One is we are in a probably Park Avenue, 
very wealthy living room. The second act is our three same actresses, but we find out different things about them. And they are clearly in another space. At the end of Act One, there's a, a medical event, if you will. And then so in Act Two, we are somewhere after this medical event. And I like that um, the set diffuses but stays the same, that some aspects of it come forward in the imagination. I, I'm really, really happy with where we've uh, ended up. Thank you for that. Uh, I was hoping maybe we could shift a little bit um, and talk about the women in The Three Tall Women and talk a little bit about the play um, and the text. And Albie is is known and praised for his complex and strong women that he writes. Um, I found an interview where he was asked what inspired him uh, to write the women that he wrote. Um, and he said that he wrote these women because he needed them. So why do you think we need these women today? What what does the audience need from these women and and possibly if you're if you're open to saying what do you need to get from these women or to learn from these women or what do you hope to learn from these women in three tall women martha well uh, <laughs> that's a big question ajoma it is <laughs> he wrote this because he was honoring his mother and i guess what you get the depiction of her uh, at the in the first part, it, it's not uh, it's not arbitrary that the play starts with her saying, "I'm 91." We know right where we are, right from the beginning, mm -hmm. and we have a sense of what we're we're about to be subjected to. The character called they're called A, B, and C. A is 91. B is 52. And C is 26. So C is exactly half the age of B, but what he gives you are uh, his mother at a very young age, his mother at middle age, and his mother at the age of 91. They are also uh, A's uh, lawyer or the representative from her lawyer's office and her caregiver. That would be B as the caregiver and C is, is the, is the lawyer is, for the estate. He is the caregiver, yeah. And C is there from her lawyer's office. What has inspired you about the, the journey of, of these women, I would say, because they're all three of them on a, on a journey. What inspires you about this? Why is it important? Why do we need to see these women? The loss and sorrow and questioning he's questioning he does this extraordinary thing with a where we see someone taking in her life coming to conclusions and going far beyond what anyone not at death's door can go and so i saying this because i think it's the reflection that's profound meditation in fact on life. Also, let us not forget, it is incredibly funny. My goodness, it's funny. It's like a um, a, a question or a, um, a, a meditation on what might happen, because we'll never know, right? No. no matter what age we're at, you know, that that moment of reflection on the life that we've lived, um, and all of the joys and the happiness that come with going back and reliving all of those memories and dealing with um, the choices we made in our life, really, we, we, we don't know until we get there. So this is a, it's a really beautiful. Um, uh, and some, pe yeah. some people will not allow themselves to, as they say, go there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's better to just kind of stay on top. This thing called mortality is there. Mm -hmm. He is a, a, a careful and thoughtful writer. It's not pre-planned. It's as though with A, you find yourself going along this way, and suddenly she goes, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. All the time with a kind of stoicism 
that engenders a, if you will, black humor. But boy, it is humor. Mm -hmm. It made me think of, Diana, when you talked about, you know, the black humor and, um, but not in a morbid way. It reminded me of the line, and I forgive me, I think it might be B that says it, that says, I'm paraphrasing, um, you know, we should teach children about, you know, that that we are dying, not not to hide it, no. but that we are not living, but that in fact that we're moving towards our death. And yeah. then if we all focus on the fact that we are moving towards death, we will live our lives. Um, yeah. But just that that you, what you said jumped out to me that that yeah. long. I would love to know um, what your first spark was with Albie's work. And what your first um, awakening was with with his um, with his plays? It was Zoo Story for Martha, maybe, or was it a different role for Diana and Fran Francesca? What about you? When did you first um, begin your relationship, which has been long and tumultuous, with this play um, <laughs> with Albie? Um, uh, well, I saw Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, which was always a fascinating title because I before I saw it, I didn't understand what. <laughs> what the play was about and you know seeing it as a younger person you know I think it's like I think he's a little bit like Chekhov you know you you see it when you're younger you don't yeah. fully comprehend the layers and as you get older um you you go oh yes the waiting the disappointment the resentment <laughs> you know I just think the writing is so um you know, it hits right where it needs to hit. Like, I think it's so uh, pointed and pointed in a good way. Um, it's, it sort of, it brings that sort of existentialism in a funny way, in a tragic comedic kind of way. And, you know, he obviously had a love hate relationship with his mother. Um, he wanted to know her. He wanted to unravel her. And I think for, especially at that time, women weren't allowed to be unraveled. And I think they spent their whole time trying to be a persona. And I think he tries to break that down. And I think, you know, and you see that in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, you see that in Three Tall Women, like breaking down that armature of what we're expected to be as women, especially in that age. Um, and, you know, you have brilliant minds of women that had to sort of embalm themselves in this sort of way of life. That's wonderful. Thank you, Francesca. Martha, what was your first um, meeting with his work? Or I got you interested? That, in I think that's brilliant, what Francesca brilliant. just said. I think that's absolutely on the nose and what this play is about. Mm -hmm. um, my first encounter was Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? which uh, we did here in Stratford at the Avon. And Diana and I did uh, A Delicate Balance here at Stratford. The second one would have been Three Tall Women in Edmonton, which I was way too young to play. <laughs> I mean, that, <laughs> sound, that sounds like a silly thing to say, but, but coming back to it now, I understand why I don't remember any of the lines because I wasn't old enough to play that part. <laughs> and now I'm not quite old enough to play the part, but I'm closer. I just had an image of, of you, Martha, now like appearing before, you know, you before <laughs> doing the show, before being like, you're, you're too young for this part. Yeah. You don't know yet, yeah. you're too young. Yeah. Get out of my way. Yeah. Very three tall women. <laughs> <laughs> we don't hear that very often as women. As actresses, yeah. you're too young for this part. <laughs> I wish I heard that more because it, it's something that to look forward to, right? Because, you know, I think that as women uh, in theater, it's like you got these parts. And then once you pass them, it's like, now what? But being able to say, you're too young for that part. You need to wait. Wait a little bit. Get older, you know, get some more experience in life. And then you'll be able to bring, as Francesca said, you know, more of your truth or or reflect more on the truth of your life. That's beautiful. When the audience sees this beautiful production, and we they haven't done it yet. <laughs> I, I said when they do. <laughs> um, what is if they if this awakens in them something and they're sparked by this production, which I'm sure many people will. 
what would you suggest for them to to um, look to next to inspire them? Another play by his or even another playwright or another book or something to inspire them um, as they move on. Go have a strong drink. <laughs> have a strong oh, drink lovely. and read. Just just think about yourself, maybe. Yeah. If, if, it, if it sparks any of that, I think it will have done a good thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe talk to a friend, a partner. A lover, a child. When you said I would child, love to see Tiny Alice. Yeah, I would love to do Tiny Alice. Tiny Alice is almost never done, and it's no. not a great play the way Small Women is, but it's a fascinating play. It's a fascinating play. He he deals with extraordinary subjects like faith and God, and I I keep. I, I read it a number of times thinking, God, I'd like to do this. And it's a terrifying play. Francesca, what would you um, recommend as the next um, inspiration? I don't know uh, Albie's works enough to kind of to say I did. I did get his biography as his, uh, his, his biography and, um, you know, it makes me want to see more. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like that. I think those are plays that can be done. I think there's small enough casts that I think that we should be doing, you know, they're always like, I always think they're kind of chamber pieces in a way, like Chekhov too, you know, they're like kind of people talking in a room, which is always interesting. Yeah. He did a number of one acts, LB, in what uh, New York, I think, described as an infertile period but it clearly was extremely fertile in many ways. And all of those plays are interesting in some way. Yeah. I think they were looked at, don't you, through a, a lens that was particularly Broadway bound. I would add to that Tennessee Williams and O'Neill. And I would add the Canadian playwright Michel Tremblay, write about women in the most extraordinary way. Uh, some and of the and John Morrell. John Morrell, of course. There is a real hunger to explore perhaps their own psyches, giving it a female embodiment. I don't know. But they are extraordinary about the way they write about women. I mean, those funny little plays, those early plays of Elby's, you know, uh, The Sandbox. He says he wrote that because, as troubled as his relations were with his family, he adored his grandmother. He just adored her. And the sandbox is about her. I love that. Uh, uh, I saw uh, an interview with him talking about that play. And he said, oh, you? you know, uh, he spoke a little bit about about A and how, you know, that was he was writing about his mother. And that in the sandbox, gr grandma is based on his grandma. But he said... Um, about his mother, A, in, in Three Tall Women, um, everyone who had met her in her life despised her, but everyone who comes to see the show loves her, loves her, <laughs> the character. And he thought that was interesting. And then he wrote about Grandma. Um, I wrote her, and I loved her very much, but I think I wrote a much interesting version of her for this play. <laughs> Is there anything, before we end, that we want to talk about about one other character that's that's in Three Tall Women, the boy? What's interesting about that is that in the play, Albie has the boy at about 23. Mm -hmm. A talks about him coming, I think it was, he was 60, Albie Al was, when he finally did connect with his mother again. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting thing Albie is doing there. Uh, that he puts the boy at 23, the boy coming to his mother's bedside holding her hand but in fact that none of that happened until Albie was 60 somebody called him and said your mom's had a it makes me think of memory and you know memories or how we hold or when we view people you know it's like that that thing of oh there you are wow you know Francesca I just I've known you all your life but you're still just that 13 year old girl you know what I mean like that sort of energy I memory wonder, and, that sort of and, and vanity B or A says, forgetting is amazing. 
Mm-hmm. And the other one says, so's vanity. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm quoting him, actually. Tying it to his own words, right? That's yeah. Nice. Well, thank you so much. Um, I would love to end our conversation with a toast. So Martha, Francesca, Diana, I'd love to know what shall we cheers to um, about the play, about the world, your hopes, your desires as we move into this brave new world of theater. Um, What shall we cheers to? I would like to toast to Foster's and hope that it will be open. Getting people vaccinated and um, getting our lives back. Places where we can meet. To meeting. meeting. To fosters. Meeting. And <laughs> to coming together again. I miss you all. You're all wonderful and beautiful. And thank you so much for this conversation. Cheers. Thank, thank you, Ajilma. Thank, thank you, you. Ajilma. Thank you for all of you joining us on this episode of Show Starters. Make sure you check out Stratfest at home and see Alexis Gordon's episodes where she follows the cabarets that will be part of the 2021 season. Until we meet again, digitally or in person, be well.